Advanced Math Lesson 76, Functions of Negative X, Functions of the Other Angle, Trigonometric Identities, Part 1, and Rules of the Game. So quite a bit to go over, but I don't think it'll take us too long. Let's start with functions of negative X. What we're going to be talking about are what are referred to as even or odd functions, uh, based on whether or not we make the, the, based on the values of the inverse function. Right, there's ways we can think of this. We can think of it by looking at the graph of the function or by uh, algebraically solving the function and seeing what the answers do. So if we look at the graph of the function, uh, even functions like this one shown here are symmetric about the y-axis, meaning that if I was to fold the graph on the y-axis like a book, these parts would match up perfectly and they would, they would all line up. And you can see that as I, right, that would match that. Also, we can trace the graph and see in opposite directions, it does the same thing. That's how we know a function's even. So as I go away from zero, traveling towards four, between zero and four and zero negative four, the graph rises. They both do the same thing. They're both rising up to four. Once I go from four to 12, they're both dropping, right? So they're still doing the same thing. It's even functions. They do the same things on the absolute value of their integers, meaning, you know, at positive, uh, what is this, number six or eight? And so at positive eight, it's doing the same thing at negative eight. We get the same answers, the same values for y, right? That's an even function, symmetric about the y-axis. Now, what we have here is an odd function. Odd functions are actually symmetric about origin. And the interesting thing is that there's no real way that I can fold it uh, to show you that symmetry, but what I can do is show you the trend. Uh, as we go in between zero and negative four, they're gonna do opposite things. So between zero and positive four, it's rising. Between zero and negative four, it's dropping, right? Then we go in between fours and twelves, the positive side begins to drop and the negative side begins to rise, right? Uh, and then same thing. So they do opposite movements, right? That's what odd functions do. They're symmetric about origin, uh, and which means that you can't really fold them to see the symmetry, but you can visually see it, right? You can kind of see the, the jagged uh, things going in opposite directions. So you can see it's symmetric about origin, meaning zero comma zero. Uh, uh, and it does opposite movements as you, as you make uh, adjustments to the graph. Now let's talk about this algebraically, right? So algebraically, let's say uh, we'll compare the, uh, the sine and cosine function, right? So let's say I've got the, let's say I've got the sine of, uh, of 30 degrees, right? uh, and then I wanted to do the, uh, the sine of negative 30 degrees, right? That would be the negative function. Let's see if sine is an even or odd function. Well, if I did sine of 30 degrees, I would do unit circle, draw a reference triangle. That's 30, of, well, why is it so tiny? Why did I draw it so tiny? Let's draw it bigger, right? So that's 30. Uh, that's 60, this is 90. To finish off this triangle, that would be uh, one, two, root three, and the sine would be the opposite of the hypotenuse, so the sine of 30 would be equal to positive one half. That equals one half. Now, let's do the sine of negative 30. If I did the sine of negative 30, well, negative 30 degrees goes that way. That's a negative 30, okay. Uh, that's gonna be one, two, oops root three, two, uh, sine is going to be opposite of the hypotenuse, uh, and that's going to be one half, but if you remember all students take calculus, cosine is the only positive thing in the fourth quadrant, which means this one half has to be negative. All right, so we see the opposite values, right? This is a positive, this is a negative, we did not get the same answer, so this is an odd function, right? Well, what about cosine? Is cosine an odd function? Well, let's test cosine for the same values. So I did cosine of 30 versus the cosine of negative 30, right? So if I did cosine of 30, it's going to be right there. It's going to be root 3, 1, and 2. Cosine is going to be root 3 over 2. So that's going to be positive root 3 over 2 because all are positive in the first quadrant. Now let's go to the fourth quadrant and do negative 30. It's going to be root 3. That's, oops, that's 1. That's 2. Uh, adjacent is root 3 over 2. Right, so then that's going to be root 3 over 2, and then the fourth quadrant calculus, or calculus, cosine is positive. So we get positive and positive. Since we have the same answer, right, for the positive or negative version of the number, this is an even function, okay? So algebraically, even functions get the exact same answer whether you plug in the positive or negative value. Odd functions get opposite answers, okay? So that's how we can catch them algebraically. And that brings me to the, uh, to the function at the other angle. That's, that's something interesting that we see here, which is that whenever we have these trigonometric identities, if I was to do, so this is interesting thing calculator-wise. If I go in my calculator and I try to write uh, the sine of negative 30 degrees, oh, wow, how did that, uh, 
What did, I, what did I do wrong the first time? I thought I put sine minus 30. Is that what I did? Oh, it's because I used the minus sign. Never mind. Clear. Never mind. Oh, oh, oh. Hit my camera. Hit my camera. It's okay. It's okay, camera. Uh, where was I going with this? Oh, no, I did need to go to the camera. Right. So if I were to type in, that's right. If, if I were to type, oh, clear. If I put minus sine of 30 degrees, why is it still trying to do answer? If I do negative sine of 30 degrees, that gives me negative 0.5. But if I do sine of negative 30 degrees, I still get negative 0.5. So that's an interesting thing about trigonometric identities, is that if you were to write the sine of negative theta, that is the same as saying negative sine of theta. So that's an interesting bit of, uh, of information that we can kind of help when we're rewriting our answers. Uh, same thing with cosine, you know, the cosine of negative theta is equal to negative uh, cosine of theta. Uh, and then same with tangent. Tangent of negative theta is also equal to negative tangent of theta. Okay, and we can see all this information on in our book between pages 466 and 467. Uh, there's the tangent one, there's the cosine one, uh, and there's the sine one. <clears throat> so it, this relationship holds for all values of theta, so that's that's just a quick thing that we can use uh, to rewrite these, right? And this is the valuable information here, which is how we can rewrite these. So if I have sine of theta, that can be negative sine of theta, and same with the cosecants and the secants and the cotangents, right? Uh, now here's another information uh, that's really interesting in, in trigonometry, which is the functions of the other angle, right? Uh, what this shows us is that the sines and cosines of complementary angles are equal to each other. So if you remember, complementary angles are angles that add up to 90. Uh, so let's say like 40 plus uh, 50. Those are complementary angles, right? They equal 90. If I were to take the sine of 40 and compare it to the cosine of 50, right? Those answers will be the same, right? That's what they mean by the other angle. We're talking about complements. So sines and cosines of complementary angles are always equal to each other, which is really, really cool to see. Uh, and you can kind of see that fluctuation on the graph, and maybe it's something I can explain a little more in class, but on the calculator, what you can see is if I type in sine of 40 degrees, if I type in sine of 40 degrees, I end up with 0 0.642787, and then if I did the cosine of the complement, which is 50 degrees, I end up with 0 0.642787. Right? It adds up every, oh, I just realized you can't see my calculator. Oh, my phone distracted me. Right, but we can see this. Uh, you get the same answer every single time. You can do this with any set of complementary angles. So any angles that add up to 90. I could do 27 uh, and uh, what's 27 plus what, what is that, like 63? Is that right? Yeah, 27 and 63, those equal 90. So let's do the sine of 27. I get 0.4539999. Let's do the cosine of, um, what is it, 63? 63, I get the same number, 0.439999. I can also switch the angles. What if I did the sine of 63 instead, right? I get a different number, 0.891. But then if I do the cosine of 27, which is the complement of 63, I get 0.891. So it doesn't matter what the angle is. They, they, always, uh, they always give you the same answer. So the complements of the other, so the sine and the cosine of the other angle will always give you the same value. That's a really interesting fact. Um, <clears throat> next, let's talk about trigonometric identities, part one, um, and the rules of the game. So, trig identities, part one, and the rules of the game, these are different ways that we're gonna rewrite problems, right? So the way this works is we know some trigonometric identities, like uh, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. We know that cotangent is equal to one over the tangent. We know the secant is equal to one over the cosine, and cosecant is equal to one over the c sine. Right, how long am I? Nine minutes. Yeah, we can do. We can add a couple more minutes to, this, to finish this lesson. So uh, we have those three identities. We also have the basic identities, which is that sine is equal to. Um, or sorry, what was it? Oh, I'm supposed to start with tangent. Tangent of theta is equal to sine over cosine. Right. That's another trigonometric identity that we can always substitute. So the right tangent, we can always write sine over cosine. Uh, instead of writing uh, sine, we could write cosine times tangent. Uh, and, and instead of writing cosine, I could always write 
um, sine divided by tangent. Okay, uh, so those are those are all three different things, but they're all variations of this one right here. This is the main one that we should memorize, along with uh, these three right here: cotangent theta, secant theta, cosecant theta. Right, the inverse. Uh, identities. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, what's called rules of the game, which is where we rewrite numbers or trig identities until we end up with the one on the right. So what they want us to do is they want us to show that the cotangent of x over the cosecant of x is equal to the cosine of x. Uh, so these are going to be uh, some pretty long difficult problems and you can all, you, this is one of the few exceptions where I'll let you use the left and right side of your work page on your homework. You know, normally we got to split it. Uh, you can use both halves of your paper for this one. So we start off by writing the original equation, which is cotangent of x over cosecant of x equals cosine of x. And I'm going to use these trig identities to rewrite the left side until I have the right side. So let's start. Uh, I remember cotangent. I can rewrite that as 1 over tangent. Okay, so I've rewritten the cotangent. Uh, cosecant, I remember I can rewrite as 1 over the sine of x, right? Uh, so now I just, let's see. Oh, I can rewrite tangent using sine over cosine. Or wait, no. Let's use the uh, let's use the Schrute de rule, right? Or multiply. So now that's sine of x over one times tangent of x. So now once I do that, this is now rewritten as uh, sine of x over uh, tangent of x. Now I'll use this rule. I can rewrite tangent of x. I'll rewrite that. So now I've got sine of x over tangent of x, which is sine of x over cosine of x, right? So I've still been rewriting. Now I'll do the Schrute de root rule one more time. Uh, and now that becomes sine of x times cosine of x over sine of x, right? Uh, and then if I'm multiplying these, I can cross cancel. Actually, I'll write this a little bit neater over here. So what I have is sine of x, I have to write it as a fraction over one times the inverse of that denominator. So cosine of x over sine of x, right? these I can cross cancel. So now that just equals cosine of x over 1, which is in fact equal to the right side, cosine of x. And now I'm done. Right Now the difficult thing about these problems is this entire block of work is your answer, which is why you can use the left and right side of the paper to solve these. Uh, so, And then when it comes to tests, you've got to show me all this work. Show me how you went from A to B. Uh, or A to Z. Right? So that's how these, these uh, problems work. It's just rewriting and then using your rules of fractions and multiplication. Uh, that's it for this lesson. If you guys have any questions, let me know on the school website and I will see you in class.